Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Harvard Law School and Harvard University. Generally, my name is John Palfrey. I have the great pleasure of welcoming you here on behalf of the institution. It is a thrill that we have the uh, ending, synthetic, um, final meetings for this round of Law.gov here on our campus. And starting today with the Massachusetts-based day and uh, heading to the um, broader, nationally-based uh, concluding day tomorrow. And by conclusion, I mean, of course, hurtling into the next phase of getting it done. Um, but hopefully coming to some common conclusions and consensus. Um, I want to thank in particular um, our great friend Carl Malin, but of course who's been the um, person who has spearheaded this process right from the start. I should note that when the Berkman Center, um, which is also affiliated here in this uh, family style event, celebrated its 10th anniversary, um, we gave out a couple of awards. And the chief award among those, as the hero, really, of um, the movement in which we perceive our research uh, to be situated, um, uh, the hero to whom we gave the Berkman 10th Anniversary Award was Carl Malibu, uh, somebody who has embodied the spirit and the energy and the commitment to um, making available the uh, world's information, particularly around the law and its connection uh, to democracy, and to make possible um, what we think uh, these technologies can do uh, in the spirit of um, leading to greater uh, democracy and so forth. So um, in the uh, uh, other piece of this is that Carl wasn't able to make it to our celebration. He um, <laughs> received a beautiful award, but um, arrived by video conference, as actually did Larry, um, both of whom were involved in important matters, trials, various other things going on. I think you were fighting war again at the time, if I recall. Um, so in a way, this is a chance to welcome Carl back physically to campus um, a few years later to um, thank him for his leadership um, and to stand beside him in what we think is really one of the most important conversations related to the internet and society. Um, also from the perspective of a library director, which I um, find myself now doing here at um, the Harvard Law School, um, I think this is possibly the most important thing we could be involved in. Um, the notion that the basic law, the primary law of the United States um, in Massachusetts as well at the state level um, ought to be free from copyright, ought to be available on the web, ought to be something around which we as professional librarians and information people can put context and make uh, possible the kinds of direct democracy and um, broader, more uh, vigorous democracy that uh, lots of people are working on. So um, it's from those multiple perspectives. I'm just thrilled uh, to welcome the group here. Um, we have uh, my um, co-convener is also Professor Lawrence Lessig. Uh, needs no introduction. Uh, in this group, he'll give uh, a uh, talk after Carl comes up. I want to thank also Professor Phil Malone, who I think is here, or maybe here is working closely with the Access to Justice Commission and Judge Fine, from whom we've here this afternoon. Um, and in particular, on uh, the library staff, Michelle Pierce, who has been um, not only the open access librarian, a new job where we have a wonderful senior, um, extraordinary person doing it, but also the, the driving force behind this event. Um, so on behalf of all of us, in this uh, broad sense, welcome. Um, and for uh, more heading into the substance, Carl Malman, welcome to Dr. Boston. Thank you. Great, thank you. Good morning. Thank you, John, Larry, and Michelle, especially for, for putting this together. Um, I want to give a few remarks uh, to kind of set the stage for what Law.gov is all about. Um, and uh, this is a two-day workshop that we're doing. And as John said, today is Massachusetts, and tomorrow is the national wrap-up. Um, I want to begin with uh, William Jennings Bryan who in his famous Cross of Gold speech said that changing conditions make new issues, that the principles upon which democracy rests are as everlasting as the hills, but they must be applied to new conditions as they arise. Well, the internet is a new condition that has arisen, and we must once again apply the principles upon which democracy rests. Uh, for the last six months, Law.gov has been a national conversation about our legal system, about how primary legal materials are distributed, and this conversation began in January at the Stanford Law School, and it concludes this week. Um, on Tuesday, we were at the Center for American Progress, and of course, all national conversations should end at Harvard Law School, so I'm really pleased to be here. Um, Fifteen workshops around the country have involved 650 participants as we've examined the basic premise of law.gov, and that is that government institutions that make the law entities that originate primary legal materials, these jurisdictions should make their work product available in bulk with no restrictions on use, and this work product should be held in authenticated, well-formatted, and complete repositories. And this principle 
goes across all three branches of government and reaches from the lowliest water district through the cities, counties, states, to the Supreme Court, the Congress, and the President. Now, by primary legal materials, we mean the work product of these lawmaking institutions, and that includes the documents of primary authority, but also includes the supporting documents they issue that one must use to interpret the law. This is a slippery slope, a definition that's most clear at the peaks of our legal system, and is a little murkier as we descend the hill to the lower jurisdictions. For the Congress, this means, obviously, the public laws, the statutes at large, and the US code, but also the hearings and reports and rules of the House. And given the place of the US Congress in our society, this means that the full archive, all the laws and all the reports and all the hearings, should be available and should be authenticated. Now, perhaps for another legislative body, such as a municipal council, the collection doesn't need to be nearly as complete. But even a municipal council should make available in bulk, with no restrictions, the current ordinances that they promulgate. For the Supreme Court of the United States, this certainly means all the opinions and the briefs and the oral arguments should be available as an authenticated repository signed by the court and accessible to all. And as we move down into the 7,436 state courts or the 3,140 counties or the 19,289 incorporated municipalities, each with their own city courts, the definition of primary legal material should obviously be adjusted. PACER system for access to our federal trial courts is a good example of inequitable restrictions on access to the law. PACER has funded $129 million in 2009 expenditures for the administrative office of the US courts. And that's a revenue stream they've come to depend upon. Birch's courtroom technology, large screen TVs, all sorts of things that, that are arguably necessary for the courts. And they're, they're very loath to relinquish that revenue stream. PACER has over 1 million account holders, and the administrative office of the courts is proud that they waive fees that are $10 a quarter or less. And they say that over 50% of their users don't end up getting billed. But $10 per quarter at eight cents per page translates into four 30-page documents. You can't do a lot of legal research with four 30-page documents every three months. So you've got to think that perhaps the demand for these materials is artificially constrained. And we shouldn't forget, if you want to be one of those one million account holders, you have to have a valid credit card. And if you don't have a valid credit card, you can go petition a judge for free access. But I'm not convinced that petitioning a federal judge is necessarily a lower barrier to access. <laughs> So what uses are not possible under the current system established for PACER? In Law.gov, we've seen several very compelling examples over the last few months. First, many valid public interest uses of bulk data in PACER are essentially prohibited. When my organization was able to audit 20 million pages of PACER documents, which would have cost over $1.5 million to purchase at retail, we found 30 district courts in substantial violation of the privacy laws. That audit of 30 district courts led to a change in the judicial conference privacy procedures, but the audit was only a small portion of the federal district courts, and our audit did not extend to the bankruptcy courts. We can't afford the price to continue the audit, a price tag of millions of dollars, and a barrier to access that stopped what we think is a valid public interest function dead in its tracks. Now, I put it to you that being able to audit the district courts of the United States for privacy violations, or for discrimination in the application of civil rights laws, or for discrimination in patent litigation by districts, or any other examination of how our system of justice functions is technically possible today, and it's only a paywall that keeps us from performing these functions. It's not just applications of legal research and public accountability that suffer when the law is not available. It's our system of legal education. A survey of 66 law schools found that 63 of them do not let their law students access PACER because of cost considerations. Our law students don't learn from our federal trial courts because of the cost. And the law students aren't the only ones who must suffer. Uh, other semi-professional uses, journalism, business research, are all self-rationing because of the costs. 
Now, there are two other effects of a paywall on a system such as PageServer, and the effects are both about innovation. Innovation in the legal market and innovation in government. Innovation in the legal market has been slow and painful for the last 20 years, and that's because the law has been parceled out to a series of exclusive concessionaires, private fences around the public domain. And that means that acquiring the rules of our society, what we call America's operating system, the code for how our legal system works, is an expensive proposition indeed. Uh, the estimate to purchase rights for a decent collection of case law, statutes, and regulatory materials in the United States is 10 to $50 million. <clears throat> if you want to be an internet startup, if you've got a better idea for how to get the law to consumers, if you have a better citator or a checking system, you need big bucks to get started. That barrier to innovation is large enough that even Google took two years searching around for a decent collection of case law before they were able to purchase the cases they needed to add their Google Scholar product. Artificial barriers to entry have meant little innovation in the private sector. And the innovation we've seen is big company innovation, which is of course useful and necessary, and it serves large enterprises such as big law firms. But the mind-bending startup, the innovative new business model, the previously unthought of niche player, those are not possible today. There is a flip side to innovation in the market, and that's innovation within government. Judge J. Rich Leonard, one of the architects of PACER, says that PACER was originated entirely within the federal courts without any external requirements. But one of the virtuous cycles of the internet is that we all learn from each other how to do things better. And external requirements are good. Judicial independence should be independence from the other branches of government, not from the public. Before coming out to Washington, D.C., and then up here to Cambridge, I spent last weekend processing government videotapes. It's one of the things that our nonprofit does. For $25, the state of California's Department of Public Health sold me a fascinating two-hour training program about the safer processing of juice. It's valuable information for those thinking of opening a juice factory, and it's pretty much obligatory if you're already in the business. Now, the video had segments on agricultural practices and raw materials, on processing design and packaging, on cleaning and sanitizing and personnel practices. But the longest segment by far was that on the regulations, requirements, and legal guidance for being in the juice business. If you want to make juice in California, you need much more than a good supply of mangoes. You need to know, know, know about these laws. Title 17 of the California Code of Regulations deals with sanitation in food plants. The Office of Administrative Law of the State of California asserts copyright over the California Code of Regulations and contracts with Barclays to publish this document. You can view the provisions on their website, but I can't make a copy that looks differently, one that's aimed specifically at juice people. For your juice business, you also need to be very familiar with the California Health and Safety Code Part 6, which is the California Food Sanitation Act. You want to be familiar with Title 21 of the Code of Federal Regulation, particularly the standards on packaging or holding human food and on sanitation standard operating procedures. You will need to be fully familiar with the HACCP regulations, which are detailed standards from on hazard analysis and critical control points from the Food and Drug Administration. The HACCP regulations, in turn, incorporate by reference a raft of technical standards, such as ANSI NSF standard number seven for commercial refrigerators and storage freezers, which is $100 per copy if you want to do due diligence on your freezer. And I can't afford the license to republish that because there is no license to republish that technical document. And these documents are just a start for the serious juice professional. Um, you're going to want to be able to consult your public safety codes, all of which are only available from a designated exclusive vendor, such as a National Electrical Code from the National Fire Protection Association. Likewise, the building codes in your jurisdiction, the fuel and gas code, the plumbing code, the fire code, elevator safety code. You'll need your local municipal code, particularly the uh, sections on zoning and factories and employment practices. Most of the municipal codes in California belong to one of the three major outsourcing companies, and over 50% of municipal codes in California have copyright restrictions. Now, my point is not that the ambitious juice entrepreneur is totally without resources to learn the law, 
But then if I want to create a new product or nonprofit site aimed at the juice people of California, and I saw that CaliforniaJuiceDudes.org is available, um, I have a hard time gathering the materials I need to set that site up. There's just too many copyright restrictions, paywalls, and other impediments to access bulk legal documents. John Adams, in his thoughts on government, said a republic is an empire of laws and not of men. Now, if a republic is an empire, it's an empire that's been balkanized by a complicated set of deeds, exclusive tenancies, and contractual fences. Walls and borders have split this empire, and the walls and borders that deny access to justice, that make equal protection under the law and due process under the law a function of the size of your wallet. It's a tax for access to justice, and to me this is no different than a poll tax on access to the ballot box. The problem with an empire of laws is that empire implies that property, it implies that law is owned by the state. But the law does not belong to the state, it belongs to the people. James Madison emphasized the importance of the rights and the sovereignty of the people to access the laws when he stated that a popular government without popular information or the means of acquiring it is but a prologue to a farce or a tragedy or perhaps both, and that knowledge will forever govern ignorance. A better geographical metaphor than an empire owned by the state to me is the shining city on the hill. Law.gov is an idea that we should all try to approach, not about who shall control the law. It's a hill we should climb. It's an idea to adopt, as John F. Kennedy said, that our governments in every branch, at every level, national, state, and local, must be as a city upon the hill. Ronald Reagan called this shining city a tall, proud city built on rocks stronger than oceans, a city with free ports that hummed on commerce and creativity, and if there had to be city walls, the walls had doors and the doors were open to anyone with the will and the heart to get here. It is not often that Ronald Reagan and John F. Kennedy saw eye to eye on the role of government. Um, so we are going to be talking about Law.gov for the next two days. I am really thrilled to um, introduce our next speaker, Professor Lawrence Lessig. Um, who has been moving out of the world of copyright for a long time, but has been instrumental in getting the Law.gov movement up and running. Um, you saw that we've done, done workshops in, in a dozen major law schools over the last six months. Um, this wasn't because uh, I've been able to call up the deans of all these major law schools. It's because uh, Professor Lessig made the introductions and introduced us to the professors uh, that, that saw that this was a good idea, and that's really what made this possible. Um, as you may know, Professor Lessig was honored last night as one of the lawyers of the decade, um, and certainly as far as the internet is concerned, he has been the lawyer of the decade, so I'm really pleased to introduce him. Larry.